um, what I'd like to talk about today is some um, some things about planet formation, and uh, I want to say a little bit about what we what we know about planet formation. Um, focus on some of the problems that are open and things we we don't know, which I think may be more things than you than you think, given that it's a, an old problem that people have studied for a long time. And also say a little bit, of course, about the work we're doing at, at, uh, at CCA uh, to try to find out more about those um, those open issues. So um, I'm happy to take questions during the during the talk. So if in, in the room people want to ask questions, just just do so. And remember to turn your microphones on so that people in Zoom can hear. So I want to begin by just saying a little bit about, um, if you like, what we would like to know about planet formation. What is the what is the goal of studying this uh, this area? And I think from a sort of solar system perspective, like an old fashioned perhaps solar system perspective, uh, the idea of you know where the Earth came from, how the Earth formed, sort of fits as the as the middle chapter of a sort of trilogy of movies of thinking on the really big scales, you know, how did galaxies form, how did stars form, how did structure form in the universe, then how did we, how did we form the Earth, and then eventually how did we go on from that to, uh, to the origin of life. So if we just sort of think on that big picture, very big picture view of things, I would sort of characterize it that most aspects of how the Earth formed are sort of understood at the level that would be in like an undergraduate physics or astronomy textbook. And as I'll emphasize, it is actually a case of most of them, and there are still things that are sort of fairly basic, which are really up for grabs in terms of how the Earth formed. But then if we sort of come to a more modern perspective, perhaps, with the discovery of, of extrasolar planets, so the first of those was 25 years ago, roughly, it's a bit, a bit more than that now. Um, one of the immediate questions that was raised by observations of extrasolar planetary systems was, is the solar system a typical planetary system? And that you know, originally came about back in sort of 1995 because the first exoplanets that were found, partly for observational reasons, looked completely different from the, from the solar system. So it immediately raised the question, well, you know, how, does, how does the solar system fit in there? And 25 years of observations later, we, we know the answer to that question. The solar system is not a typical example of, the, of a planetary system because if we look at a random star, we find that those stars have pretty massive planets, Earth mass or bigger, in close in orbits that are well inside where Mercury is in the solar system. So if we just sort of picked a star at random, it wouldn't actually look like the solar system. It would not look like the solar system, so our solar system, yeah. So we know that, so that part is sort of determined, but the part that's still open is whether, if you like, the solar system is, you know, just a little bit different from one of those uh, planetary systems, or whether it's really a sort of more rare kind of outcome of the process. And that question is interesting, and it's also hard to define. Yeah, just a quick question about that previous statement. Do we feel that we have a, a broad enough, truly random sample uniformly distributed over the various kinds of solar systems to answer the question as definitively as you've answered it? Yeah, so, so, so the question is, do we have a good sample for that? Across all kinds yeah. of yeah. So it, it depends exactly what you mean. So if we think about stars in the solar neighborhood, right? So relatively speaking, in our region of the galaxy, I mean, not really close to us, but in our region of the galaxy, NASA's Kepler satellite stared at a, basically a blank, you know, a random patch of sky and monitored all the stars in that region. So if we think about stars that are sort of the same mass as the sun and lower, and in our region of the galaxy, the answer is yes, we, we have a good sample. Uh, if you I, went... I guess what I'm at, I, I don't know exactly how evolved the art of detecting uh, extra planetary solar systems you know, uh, is. Um, so can we in fact say that we can detect Earth-like planets at roughly Earth-like orbits for stars that are considerably far away from us? With yeah. the probability yeah. we're comfortable so, so, that. So it depends on how far away the planets are from the star and also the type of star. But if it's if it's a star sort of like the sun and the planets are, let's say, Earth distance from the sun or closer, then you know we have the technology is good enough for that. If you go further out, the answer is you know it's everything is open. Yeah. But you know, we, we are restricted to our region of the galaxy. So and the galaxy, the stars in the galaxy have different properties in different places. So if you went very close to the galactic center, for example, you know, it'd be a different story and 
observationally, you wouldn't be able to say anything. So yeah, so is it, so are we a bit atypical or are we, are we really rare? And so there there's a sort of question of definition because all planetary systems and all planets are gonna be a bit individual in their own way. And so you have to ask, well, which aspects of being similar or different are the things you care about? And you know, a lot of people care about whether planets are habitable and maybe eventually looking for evidence of life in the atmospheres of planets. So an important metric is, you know, are the characteristics that make the Earth habitable shared by many other planets around stars or not? And that aspect observationally, you know, remains, remains unclear. So maybe that's a bit abstract. So I'd like to um, begin by just sort of giving an example of one property of a planetary system that we're interested in. And, you know, well, how do we sort of understand it? And the question is, how did we get water on the, on the Earth, okay? And so water is obviously very important for habitability. It's the sort of one of the basic things people agree about as being important. And there's just one piece of sort of physics or chemistry that we have to think about here, which is that if we go to low pressure environments, the stable phases of water is not liquid water, it's ice or water vapor, it's solid or, solid or gas. And in the environments in which planets form, which I'll discuss in a little bit, bit later, I'll just tell you that the temperature which separates solid ice from water vapor is about 150 K or 170 K or something like that. It's, it's really pretty, it's pretty cold. So if you think about that, you can make a sort of simple prediction. If you imagine a planet like the earth, so basically a solid planet, and it's forming from sort of material in its orbit at some distance from the star, its composition should be quite closely tied to what the temperature of that material is. So if you're below this 150K uh, boundary, then most of the oxygen that we have sort of present in that environment will end up in water ice or in hydrated minerals of some kind. And those will all be assembled into the planet as it grows. And because oxygen is a common element in the universe, that's a lot of water. And so you end up then with a prediction that you know, half or two thirds of the planet by mass should be made of water. So it'd be sort of a water world. And if you think about the outer solar system and look at an object like Pluto, which is sort of a small solid object far out there, indeed it's, you know, it's got a lot of ice in it, okay? And if that object was trauma, somehow transported to the inner solar system, then on the surface that would be, you know, that would be liquid water and it would be some enormously deep ocean. On the other hand, if you're above that temperature of 150K, the water will just be in the, in the gas phase. It will just keep flowing in towards the star. It will be lost. It won't be accumulated in the planet and the planet will be dry. Now, convert that to how things will go for the earth. You need to know, well, what, what is the temperature where we are in the solar system before the earth formed? And there was just gas and dust in orbit around the sun at that time. But that temperature would still be set by the same sort of physics as sets the temperature on Earth today, the strength of, of sunlight at some early stage in the sun's evolution. So it would be roughly speaking the same as it is today, 300 Kelvin. So we would say that the Earth is well inside the snow line. We're in this sort of dry region of the, of the planetary system. So the prediction would obviously be that the Earth is, should be dry. And obviously that is not the case. The most thing we know about the Earth is that it's covered with water. So this is a, an immediate failure of like a very simple theoretical prediction. So if we just really think about the Earth, you know, we, we know the answer to this conundrum, but you know, it's taken planetary scientists decades of work to really figure it out. And the key is that you can measure another property of the uh, water on the Earth beyond the fact of just you know, how much of it we have. And that is the ratio of deuterium, heavy hydrogen to regular hydrogen. So you can measure that deuterium to hydrogen ratio in water on the earth and compare it to reservoirs in the solar system, which you can also measure by various means. And it's found that that D to H ratio is not a good match for comets. So, you know, if you sort of pose this question and you hadn't thought about it, the sort of obvious answer is, well, the water on the earth comes from comets because we know that those are like icy objects that occasionally would hit the earth, but they don't actually have the right D to H ratio. So it's a better match for asteroids in the outer region of the asteroid belt. So the general uh, expectation, the general thought is that the relatively modest water fraction we have on the Earth came ultimately from sort of the outer region of the asteroid belt, 
And at some point, those asteroids were transported, scattered into the inner solar system. They hit the Earth, perhaps at a late time, and contributed the Earth's water reservoir. So that's probably what happened for the Earth. So that's a, that's a story that planetary scientists have worked out that has sort of lessons, I think, for when we think about extrasolar planets, where we can't observe them in anything like the same amount of detail as we can in the solar system. So one lesson is that we have to think about planetary systems, not planets in isolation. Because once you get beyond the most basic properties of a planet, like its mass, the more complicated properties are very closely interlinked with what else is going on in the, in the planetary system where you're considering that planet. Another issue is that the most basic things about habitability for the Earth, at least in this case of the, the Earth in the solar system, are actually sort of quite subtle and, and non-obvious, right? So it's not just the case of how far you are from the star determines what sort of uh, water content you would have for the, uh, for the planet. And then if you don't know how a planetary system forms, you don't know about asteroid belts and Jupiters and Saturns and things like that, it's actually quite hard to make even a, a reasonable guess about what the composition, what the atmosphere, ultimately what the habitability of a, of a planet would look like. Okay, so there's some sort of cautionary, cautionary lessons from this basic piece of, of solar system physics. Phil, can I ask a question about the, the other axis in your uh, phase diagram for water, which was the pressure axis? It sounds like if we didn't have a high pressure atmosphere, then all of this water that came in from asteroids would have just evaporated anyway. It, it, do we know where the, the distribution of planets out there lie in terms of the sort of pressure of, of gases and whether that's enough to hold liquid water in the liquid state. Yeah, so that's a that's a uh, you know that's also a deep and complicated question, right? And so generally we think that you know many planets would have sort of two types of atmospheres. So there would be a primordial atmosphere which was perhaps gathered from the gas and dust when the planet was forming, which in many cases is going to be lost. And then a subsequent atmosphere forms by outgassing from the interior. So probably it's that second, you know, it's that secondary atmosphere we have on the Earth. Um, and so as long as we have enough water-bearing material that forms the Earth, you know, that will eventually be expelled into the atmosphere and potentially, you know, give us something. Um, I think that you know the greater danger is sort of on the other end, that it's like very easy to have a much heavier atmosphere than the Earth. And then, you know, even though the temperature at the surface may be uh, quite suitable for life, the temperature at the surface of the planet is, is much higher. Yeah. Okay, so let's um, say a little bit now uh, about what we do know about planet formation, some basic things. And so one thing we know is, is the environment. And we know that really from direct, well, reasonably direct observations, as, as direct as we sort of have in, um, in astronomy. So, you know, what we have here, is, um, is an image, a composite image um, of, a, of a young protoplanetary disk. So a disk of gas and dust orbiting a young star. And we've got sort of two, two sets of images here. These sort of orange rings here are emission in short wavelength radio waves, sort of millimeter wavelength, which trace the distribution of dust around that star. So you can sort of see its, its disk-like morphology with also these rings here present in this system. And then there's a, a background image, which is, which is taken in different wavelengths, which is this blue colors, which is actually showing a, a jet of material which is being launched from, from near the vicinity of the, of the star, and which I'm not going to say more about in the, in the context of this talk, though it's obviously very interesting, and it's you know, related perhaps to the sorts of jets we see from black holes in completely different astrophysical systems. So we can actually you know, observe these things quite well, and so we know quite a lot about their physical properties. Um, so they have scales that are sort of similar to the solar system or, or larger. The temperature is obviously hot, close to the star, 1,000 degrees Kelvin. It's down to maybe 20 Kelvin if you go really far out. The densities are what we describe as, as high in astrophysical terms, but, you know, a very good vacuum in, in sort of more terrestrial terms. And the masses are a small fraction, typically, of the mass of the star, 10% down to 0.1%, uh, as I've written it on this slide. And the material is mostly hydrogen and helium gas. Uh, it also contains other molecules, which are actually what we typically observe when we observe molecules. So we observe things like carbon monoxide. And then there's solid material, which is initially in the form of dust. And that might be you know, made up of silicates, 
ices, various other sort of common, common materials. And we know that the lifetime of these disks is pretty short by astronomical timescales. It's a few million years. So it's you know, a tenth of a percent or less of the lifetime of a, of a star. So we see these planet forming disks only around very young stars. Well, that's the environment. And we also have a sort of general picture of how planets grow there, which is a, which is a bottom up picture of planet formation. So you start with very small dust particles, microns in size. Those collide with each other by various processes. So Brownian motion is one, but then there are others. They collide and stick. And then the, the larger aggregates stick to even larger aggregates. And the whole thing builds up this way. And you're, you're seeing a movie of simulations that were, that were not done here. They're done by a Japanese group showing how those aggregates um, build up. And it's pretty well established both from those kind of calculations and also from lab experiments in microgravity that that kind of direct sticking process builds you up to things that are maybe millimeters or centimeters in size. So you get to sort of small macroscopic dimensions just by things hitting each other and sticking. So from that size, the next step is to build sort of the first objects that look like I don't know, small asteroids or comets. And those are described as planetesimals. And the image that you're seeing here is a, an object far out in the solar system that was visited by the New Horizons spacecraft a few years ago, which may be you know, one of the remnants of those planetesimals that we can still see in the solar system. So those are things that are kilometers or maybe larger in size. And from there on in, there's sort of a, a two track way of making the different kinds of planets. If we think about planets like the Earth, so basically solid planets, the idea is that the planetesimals collide with each other now under gravity, so not just sort of random collisions, but pulled together by gravity. They collide and grow bigger. And then maybe also the growing objects sweep up some of the, the pebble-sized stuff that was left over that didn't form planetesimals. And one way or another, that process continues until you end up with something like, like the Earth. If you do the same thing uh, maybe further out in the planetary system, and you get to something that's much bigger than the Earth, maybe three or five times the mass of the Earth, then the gravity of that planet is large enough to really pull in a large amount of gas from the surrounding disk. So at that point, you don't just have sort of an atmosphere around the planet, you have really a thick envelope. And if that goes far enough, you end up with something like Saturn or Jupiter, which is really dominated by gas and only has a relatively small solid content. So that's the sort of overall picture. And at the, at the level of description I've just put on this slide, you know, everything here is thought to be a pretty secure understanding of, of, what, of what happens. So that's what we think we, we know. Why is it difficult to learn more, to have more details about how this process takes place? Well, the main thing is that although we have a huge amount of observational data, it's really sort of quite restricted in the parameter space that it, it occupies. So on this sort of here, I've sort of schematically sketched time on the x-axis and then the size of things that we can see on the vertical axis. So when we look at protoplanetary disks, we're looking at young systems, a few million years old. So that's a very small time fraction of the late lifetime of a star. And directly, we can observe you know, small dust particles up to things that are maybe millimeters or centimeters in size. So those things are, you know, have a good, good observational grounding, but it's only in that corner of the, of the parameter space. We can also see you know, lots of extrasolar planetary systems, thousands of them now. And what you're seeing here is uh, a compilation of the multiple planetary systems that were found by NASA's Kepler satellite. And there's you know, hundreds of those. But those are mostly around stars that are, that are old, billions of years old, so sort of similar to the sun. And the planets themselves are, you know, in some cases a little bit smaller than the Earth, but not, not much smaller. So they're sort of the size of the Earth up to the size of Jupiter or a bit larger than the size of Jupiter. So that's the, the, the late large part of the, of the axis. And in the middle, all the scales and time scales in the middle are sort of practically very difficult to observe. And that's particularly the case for sort of intermediate sized bodies that maybe are you know, 100 kilometers in size. If you ask, how would you see a 100 kilometer object around another star or even a population of those objects, um, that's really well out of reach for, for anything we can do. So that's, you know, that's, the, uh, that's why we need theory, right? Why well, we can't just observe the process. So you know, that's, that's good. But it also means that there are a lot of scales where the theory is sort of not anchored by direct observations. 
And likewise, you know, we can do experiments with little dust particles, collide them together and stick. Uh, you know, you're not going to collide together two kilometer sized objects in the lab and determine whether they stick or break apart. Only in, well, only in a science fiction movie anyway. Phil, Phil, sorry to ask another question, but can you explain what's going on in that animation on the left, on the upper right that you just had? It seems like you've centered a bunch of little simulations on some kind of grid points on a, on a, in a box, but then it also seems like things are colliding and, and becoming bigger. Is that because you're like running into the, you're simulating existing planetary systems into the future and they end up colliding? Is okay, so I, I, I probably shouldn't have showed this movie because oh. it's actually got nothing whatsoever to do with any of that. Oh, so, okay. uh, <laughs> okay. so, so right, this, but, but it's even, but it's in some ways it's better because this is actual real, this is based on real data. So these are planetary systems, actual planetary systems that were discovered by NASA's Kepler satellite through the transit method. And it's those planetary systems where there's more than one planet. So they're actually all to scale. And so, you know, they're just like, you know, they're just little animations of how the planets are going around those stars. Yeah, at each one centered at a different point. So you can see them and the, the sizes of the circles show the, the sizes of the planets and so forth, right? So it's, it just, well, mainly it's to demonstrate that Kepler found a ton of these systems, you know, um, and it's also a pretty thing. If I've had the movie on, it, it even has some, some, some uh, if I had the sound on, it even has some soundtrack, but we don't have that. Uh, so there's a, you know, a lot of, these are the close in planetary systems that I said were like super, super common. Okay, so let's, um, let's turn then to these sort of questions of, of things we don't know, or things where there's big uncertainty. And so the first question is, I'm gonna have three of these questions. So the first one is sort of, a, I'm gonna spend most of the time on and I'm gonna say more briefly two others. The first question is, you know, when do planets form? How quickly does this process I've described play out in real systems? And the old answer where, you know, old is maybe only 10 years old was that this is a fairly slow process, okay? So in the, the left-hand side here, you're seeing a simulation of the formation of the terrestrial planets. So it's distance from the star on the x-axis, eccentricity on the, on the y-axis, and you're seeing uh, a purely gravitational simulation of, you know, initially fairly small bodies being scattered in their orbits until they collide with each other, growing into bigger things, and then continuing to do so. And the colors are actually showing how water gets mixed in that system with that story of the asteroid belt I gave before. And it's just stopped here at 200 million years. And you can see that you formed there three planets, um, roughly speaking, where Venus, Earth, and Mars are with pretty low eccentricity. And then there's a, a few dots further out that are sort of a, something like the asteroid belt, okay? And it's taken quite a long time. And that is actually sort of consistent with what we think we know about the moon, because we think the moon formed in one of the last or the last of these giant impacts on the earth. And there's you know, efforts to date that from uh, you know, looking at lunar rocks, which maybe put that time at like 50 or 100 million years after sort of the earth got started forming. So that's, you know, that's, that's a long time. It's longer than that three or 5 million year gas disk lifetime I was talking about. Now, if you form giant, want to form giant planets, you've got to do two things. You've got to, first of all, you've got to build that core of a few earth masses. That's going to take some time. And then the gas has got to flow in onto the planet as well and contract to, to you know, form Jupiter. And in order for the gas to flow in, it has to lose energy, it has to radiate energy away. And you know, if the gas is full of dust, it's quite uh, you know, opaque. So it takes time for that radiation to flow out and for the, for the planet to get built. So the, the standard answer is that you can form Jupiter in you know, a few million years where Jupiter is. Um, but if you went further out in the planetary system to tens of astronomical units, tens of Earth sun distances, then the time scale for building a, a planet like Jupiter would be you know, effectively infinite, right? It just wouldn't happen. And as you know, we, we looked at that, a group of us looked at it recently, you know, trying to do better radiation hydrodynamics simulations of basically how the energy gets out of those planets. And the bottom line was actually we found a result that was pretty consistent with what people found back in the 90s. It really takes by standard processes quite a long time to build a planet like Jupiter. So that's, that's the expectation. Um, but observations of disks uh, in the last you know, five years, 10 years, have really challenged that view and that theory. And what you have here is just a, a compilation of images of protoplanetary disks. Um, so this comes actually from Quantum Magazine from a, from a little while ago. Some of them are taken in uh, radio wavelengths and some are in, in optical or near infrared wavelengths. 
But the point just to notice is that these disks don't seem to have a sort of smooth distribution of emission. A lot of them have rings of emission, and then some of them have other structures that look more like spirals. So if we can uh, see here, let's see, here we go. So yeah, so, so this is a classic example. This is a case where you see multiple rings of emission around the, around the star. And then here's a case where you see the, the, uh, the structure is more in the, in, in the form of uh, spirals. And then there's some other examples of kinds of structure you see there as well. So most of disks that we observe closely enough show this kind of substructure. So it's common, rings, spirals, crescents. Well, that's what we see. Um, why is that um, a puzzle? Well, in one way, it's, it's really good because it's long been known that one way to make structures like that is to have planets in the disk and the gravity of the planets perturbs the gas and then the perturbed gas manages to sort of concentrate dust in some kind of observable substructure um, in the disk. So I've written a textbook on planet formation. So I was writing this like 15 years ago. And the first edition had like a simulation of that process. And you see the planet there has made a, a dark gap. It's carved out a gap around its orbit. And you see a sort of spiral wake propagating out into the disk. And you know we weren't the first to do those kind of simulations. Those simulations were being done even in the 1980s. So it's, it's a really old result. Okay, so you step forward, you know, 10 years, we see that in direct observations of disks. The second edition has one of those actual data on the cover. You know, it looks pretty much the same thing. So that sounds great. It's a sort of example of theory that appears to have been confirmed by observation, but there's a but, there's a but um, which is that the observed rings are in many cases a long way from the star. So they're like 50 or hundred times the Earth's sun distance um, away. And moreover, they're seen in pretty much every disk we look at closely enough, including disks where the star seems to be really young, so less than a million years old. It's hard to date young stars, but you, know, you can make some, some efforts to do that. So in the sort of standard old theory, planets should not form that fast, nor should they form that far from the star. So if, in fact, those rings are being caused by planets, uh, if you like, we've confirmed the aspect of how planets interact with their gas disks, so that's good, but we have a problem in understanding how we actually form those planets um, in the first place. So basically, we don't know what's, what's going on here, right? So this is a, a big open question. A lot of people are working on that from both a theory and an observational point of view. But there are, there are various possibilities, um, so I'll just skip through the, the possibilities. Um, so the first possibility is that when I said, well, it looks like we would have planets and planets would be doing that, maybe actually that's not right at all. Maybe it's the case that a protoplanetary disk can spontaneously develop rings in its structure, even if there are no planets there at all, okay? And I don't wanna go into that particular possibility anymore today. We, there was actually a, um, uh, an FRF at CCA a few years ago who worked quite extensively on that possibility. There are various um, magnetohydrodynamic possibilities for how that might work, right? And you know, people argue about how plausible those are or not, but it's a, it's a possibility. But most people, for various reasons, prefer the idea that they're planets, and there are actually a few cases where the planetary interpretation has been confirmed. So there's you know a little bit of, of reason for that. So there are there are two other ways in which it might work. Um, so one possibility is that we abandon the solar system sort of idea that growth starts at small things and just kind of steps up consecutively to bigger and bigger objects. So we go from dust to centimeters to planetesimals, which are kilometer size, and then those keep colliding in a sort of pairwise fashion. So the basic idea is that instead of that, we, we make some biggish objects and then they grow really quickly by sweeping up a lot of the small stuff, which is sort of left over. So it's like the, the protoplanets sort of grow from like a hailstones or something like that in the, in the protoplanetary disk. So there's a plot here from a, a very recent paper by, a, by um, a Vlad Lyra's group in New Mexico discussing how that works. And I'll say a little more about that in a minute. Um, and then there's a third possibility, which is actually maybe the most exciting, which is you know, maybe this uh, data is pushing us towards actually a different mode of planet formation that could take place in really young disks, but would not be able to take place in the older disks that were the previous focus um, of planet formation theory. And this is an idea which we're looking at in sort of various dimensions. Um, 
uh, here, here at the moment. But let me step back to the previous possibility, the idea that it's pebbles that are sort of saving the day here. Um, and if we go back to sort of the first part of that cartoon I showed earlier, um, I sort of left out an important part. I said, we go from microns to millimeters by things colliding and sticking. And then we make planetesimals that are kilometers in size. And I didn't say, well, how does that step, how does that step work, okay? And that step is, has for a long time been a, been a puzzle. So if I'd been giving this talk 10 years ago, maybe, I would probably have made that step as being like the biggest unknown in, in planet formation theory. Um, but we have made some progress there. Um, and we think we know a mechanism that can do it. Um, but it's, you know, it's quite a subtle and complicated mechanism that it actually relies very extensively on numerical simulations to try and understand the details. But the basic idea is that if you have gas and then you have solid particles, so you know, centimeter sized objects, let's say pebbles, which are interacting aerodynamically through drag forces with that gas, it turns out there's a, there's a linear instability of that coupled system. And in this context, it's called the streaming instability. There are also many other streaming instabilities in astronomy, but this is a streaming instability. And the nonlinear evolution of that is to form dense clumps of solid material, dense clumps of pebbles. And so the basic idea is that this instability forms dense clumps of pebbles, and those clumps become so dense that they collapse under their own gravity to form the planetesimals. So it's sort of quite distinct from how growth occurs at either smaller or larger scales, because it's really a collective phenomenon, right? So it's not individual things colliding in pairs, it's a whole clump of stuff that, that happens to collapse down to form a planetesimal. So we and many others have, have, have done work on that, simulations on that. I was, I was showing some work from uh, uh, Oshin Lee and, and Andrew Yudin. Um, it's, a, it's a complicated story, but basically if you can have a protoplanetary disk and have enough mass of pebbles of the right size at the right place, the instability can be triggered, and then it will work as I've described. Clumps will form, gravity will, will bring things down, and you'll make the planetesimals. And you know, the movie you, you sort of saw there, um, you know, maybe for, for those who've sort of seen you know, pictures of cosmology simulations of galaxies forming, you know, it looks a little bit the same, right? And of course, the reason is that it's gravity, which is basically here drawing together a, a collisionless fluid, which here it's pebbles and galaxies, it would be dark matter, and that's kind of driving this kind of structure formation, okay? So that's maybe how it works. And it's interesting from this point of view of how quickly we can form planets, because when we do simulations of this, one of the things we agree on is that the mass function of the planetesimals you form is top heavy. So if you take a certain amount of mass, most of that mass ends up in a small number of the largest objects. There's also like a zillion small objects. So by number, the small objects win hugely but most of the mass ends up in the, in the big things. And for reasonable parameters, the big things can actually be quite big. So I said planetesimals were like kilometer sizes. That's like an old fashioned view. If they form by this mechanism, they may be hundreds of kilometers in size. So then really they're you know, like the largest asteroids we see in the asteroid belt or very large comets, you know, extremely large comets that we basically very rarely see uh, in the inner solar system. So that's what we, uh, that's what we think. Um, the simulations of this process are very challenging. Um, basically, you've got two fluids, they're interacting with each other. So, you know, asking how well converged that is, do we understand how it works, particularly for a distribution of particle sizes is, is hard. But there's some promising agreement with things we see in the outer solar system. So that object that was flown by Arakoff uh, looks like perhaps it was made by this kind of process. So that may be what's um, going on. We think that's maybe what's going on. And that then sort of allows us to make perhaps a, a story, maybe a slightly challenging one to make working details for how you can make planets quickly far from the start. And the idea would be you form the pebbles. We know that part is fast. You trigger this streaming instability and you make a small number of very big planetesimals or sort of minor planets. And then the minor planets accrete a lot of the remaining pebbles and then they grow very quickly. Okay, and that escapes the bottlenecks that would otherwise be present in sort of the solar system mode of planet formation. So that's a, a possibility, maybe it's a plausible possibility. You know, a big un unknown is that we don't really know what sets the balance between the planetesimals and the pebbles. So in, a, in one of our simulations, which are like little boxes of gas and dust, 
once you start forming those planetesimals, actually most of the mass just ends up in the planetesimals, right? So then you've got no pebbles left over. We know that's not true because we see pebbles in protoplanetary disks, so we know they survive somehow, but we haven't really got a good understanding of, of, what, of how that works. Okay, so that's one possibility. Another possibility is uh, maybe there's a new mode of planet formation. And the sort of possibility here is that if we go early enough, the disks around young stars would be, we think, more massive than the tenth of the stellar mass that I was talking about earlier. They might be half the stellar mass. Sufficiently early time, there wouldn't have been a star at all, and so all of the material would have been sort of in falling in some way. So those disks that would be massive would be self-gravitating in the sense that their dynamics would be controlled also not just by the gravity of the star, but also by the gravity of the disk gas itself. And so that is a situation you know, we also see sort of in galaxies and works the same way pretty much. You end up forming spiral arms in the disk. This is a simulation. Uh, you form spiral arms. Maybe again, that's what's being seen in some of those images of young protoplanetary disks. And then in those environments, things can, be, things can work a little bit different. And we've sort of explored some aspects of that or are exploring some aspects of that now. So uh, Winry Zhu here is uh, FRF at uh, CCA has been looking at how the pebbles grow in that scenario. And we find that you can grow somewhat larger pebbles, actually quite a lot larger pebbles in sort of the dense environments of self-gravitating disks compared to what's assumed at a later stage. So instead of maybe stalling at millimeter sizes, maybe you can grow 10 or, or 100 times larger than that, okay? And then if you grow those larger pebbles, they may collect together in the spiral arms in such a way that they can gravitationally collapse in the spiral arms to form objects directly. So Cristiano Longarini, who, who visited here for a while in the spring, last spring, has done simulations of that process. And again, with the right, with the right parameters, the right assumptions, the spiral arms can collect together material that could collapse and directly form planets very quickly. So do those scenarios work? There's a, a lot of uncertainties in really you know, piecing together whether the conditions and whether the physics really works well enough for that, for that to happen and how that kind of model would fare compared to those other possibilities that I was describing before. But it's something we're interested in and we're hoping to work more on. Okay, so let me now turn more briefly to the other questions. Um, so I was sort of talking about what happens early on. What about if we think about what happens really late and what determines the final shape um, of a planetary system? So the question here is, is the final shape of a planetary system sort of controlled at the point where the planetary system has first formed? So that's maybe at a few million years, or does it, you know, does it continue to evolve for a much longer period? And if we go back to when exoplanets were first discovered, uh, the first exoplanet to be discovered was a Jupiter sort of type planet in a few day orbit around a star, so-called hot Jupiter. And an immediate interpretation of that was that that planet could not have formed where it was now seen, it formed much further out. And then by interacting with the gas, with the disk of gas and dust it formed from, it migrated inwards and then ended up stalled close to the star. And that was you know, an, a, an attractive and an immediate um, hypothesis because there was work even dating back to 1980 discussing exactly how that process might take place, how a planet might lose angular momentum to its disk, move towards the star on a relatively short time scale. So gas disk migration was considered to be a, a good way of forming the hot Jupiters. Now, the next few planets that were found back in the, the, the sort of mid nineties, many of those were further out and they had quite eccentric orbits, sometimes very eccentric orbits. And again, an, an immediate explanation for that was sort of put forward. Perhaps what happens is that these planetary systems were initially, uh, the planets were quite closely packed together. So they were unstable uh, on a long period. Uh, they had close encounters, had some collisions, some of the planets maybe got ejected, and then the result was that the survivors ended up with eccentric orbits. And you can do very simple numerical experiments of that kind of process, where you just take a few Jupiter mass planets, put them on circular orbits, but close enough to be unstable, let it evolve for a, a few million or a few billion years, becomes unstable, that happens, and you get a distribution of eccentricities that actually matches very well what, what is seen. So it seemed like you know, the whole matter was, was done and dusted. Um, theory had been, uh, had been found that would explain the observations. However, subsequent observations have suggested a much more complex situation. And the key one, perhaps, is that at some point it was realized that you could measure 
the inclination of exoplanet orbits with respect to the equator of the star as defined by the stellar spin. So in the solar system, the planets orbit pretty much in the plane of the sun's equator. There's about seven degrees misalignment in the solar system, right? So it's pretty much you know, in, in the plane as you would expect. The, the sun is rotating this way, the planets are in a disk around the sun. But in a fraction of these hot Jupiter systems, these exoplanet hot Jupiter systems, the planets do not lie in the equator. They can be polar orbiting, or they can even be tipped over and retrograde. Okay, and that's clearly a really puzzling thing. It's like a really amazing thing to find. Okay. And again, there was like some theory that had been developed in the 60s to think about asteroids in the solar system that gave an immediate possible explanation for that. If you have uh, a star that's part of a binary star system, and the binary star system is misaligned with respect to the planetary system, then there can be an instability which causes the orbit of the planet to become both very eccentric and very inclined, the sort of, a, the sort of oscillations of that, of that process. And so that's a, a different way of making hot Jupiters. Maybe you form the Jupiters far out, they have these oscillations, they become super eccentric. At some point they closely approach their star and then tides bring the orbit down and circularize it at, at small scales. And it's a completely different way of making hot Jupiters, which can however make uh, those inclined systems. And then you know, there were other puzzles that were later found for lower mass planets, which were discovered by the Kepler satellite. So those observations and then you know, subsequent theoretical work have to some degree just muddied the waters in finding many possible physical processes that could plausibly be playing a role in these kind of observations. And here's just a, you know, a, a list of them, which I don't really want to go through, but basically the, the gas disk migration has been found to be much more complicated than was assumed in the 1980s. That's obviously not a surprise because the 1980s calculations were pencil and paper and now people are doing simulations. And then the purely gravitational dynamics is also extremely rich. And so there are many ways in which it, it can work depending on you know, exactly the configuration of the planetary system or the stellar binary system in which you start. So you know, a lot of fascinating work has been done on this, but the basic question, which you might hope to pose remains open. What is really causing the observed systems that we see? Presumably some of these processes are more important than others. You know, they could all work at some level, but presumably some of them are dominant. Which are those? And you know, in the early solar system, which of those, if any, worked in the, in the solar system? And you know, 25, more than 25 years after the discovery of those first exoplanets, those basic questions actually still remain um, open. There is progress here, so I, I, don't, want to, I don't want to make this on a, on a negative note. There's computational progress. Uh, so I would say, you know, in the last few years, really for the first time, we've gotten to the point where we can simulate these gas processes with pretty good fidelity, right? So we can go beyond just exploratory experiments to calculations that we think are re yielding the, the correct answer for how quickly planets should migrate and move around in the gas disk due to these processes. And we have people here doing those, those calculations. And then we're also trying to understand how to do the, the in-body dynamics, the gravitational dynamics, approximately but quickly. So we can, we can already do that with very high fidelity with uh, numerical integrations, but they take a long time. And so we're developing some machine learning approaches that can give approximate answers that we think are good enough to then embed in larger calculations of, of how planetary systems evolve. And they're also promising observational directions, which the, which the data group, especially at CCA, is looking at, trying to find, if you like, some of the missing links, perhaps, between planets that start far out and end up close in. At some point, they must have been sort of halfway. Uh, those would be so-called warm Jupiters. And if we can find a sample of those, you know, maybe that tells us how the, how the migration process takes place. And there's some other, other directions that we can also take in that, in, in that way. Okay, so let me then just finish off with a couple of minutes on uh, a final topic, um, which is uh, a different kind of, uh, of astronomical object, a circumplanetary disk. So, so far I've been talking about disks around stars and forming planets within those disks. However, we can also have disks around the planets themselves, at least if they're giant planets like Jupiter. And in those disks, we would be interested in the formation of, of moons or satellites rather than planets. And you know, the existence of such disks has been known about for a long time, or at least inferred for a long time, because if you look at the Galilean satellites of Jupiter, they all lie in a, in a, in a plane. And Kant and probably many other people, you know, more than a century ago, 
observed it looks like a miniature solar system, and therefore it probably formed in the same way as the solar system from a disk. And in a more modern way, we think what happens is that the, the giant planet opens a gap in the disk, but then as gas continues to flow across the gap towards the planet, it circularizes in a, in a little circumplanetary disk around the planet. So that's our theory. And what's been very exciting the uh, last couple of years is that there's been the first detections of those systems. So here's, a, here's another uh, ALMA image. Uh, so this is an our radio image here. So here you have a star. And here you have a disk, which is you can just see the ring here. And then you see this dot at the 3 o'clock position. That's the location of, a, of an extrasolar planet, in this case, a young extrasolar planet in that, in that disk. And if you look at this closely enough, that dot is actually resolved. It's not just a point. It has an actual spatial extent. And that is the circumplanetary material, we think, around that, around that planet. So we've sort of found one, or observers have found one of those two systems for the first time. So theoretically, that's very exciting because quite basic questions about circumplanetary disks are completely open. So on the small scales, we don't know how the gas in that circumplanetary disk ends up joining the planet and making it you know, grow larger. So one possibility is that the planet has a magnetic field and the gas sort of flows along the magnetic field and hits the, hits the planet in a, in a, in a shock, in a, in a hot spot. That's what we think happens for young stars. Another possibility is that the planet magnetic field is not as strong and the gas sort of flows into the equator and forms a, a belt, if you like, around the equator of the planet. And which of those is, is, is the right answer uh, has a lot of implications for how, how fast planets spin, how we might detect them, and whether planets might launch jets, small jets perhaps, like that star that was launching a jet I showed in, in the image at the start. On the larger scale, we don't know whether circumplanetary disks are sort of isolated entities being fed with gas that then just feeds on into the planet, or whether some of that gas actually manages to escape back into the protoplanetary disk in a sort of circulation flow. So that's another question we've been, we've been looking at, and we found some evidence that maybe under some circumstances it can be that escaping mode rather than just the, the inflowing mode. And that has actually a lot of implications for how easily you might be able to form uh, moons within those circumplanetary disks. And that's something we've been you know, looking at different numerical approaches in particular to try to understand. And then finally, uh, sort of more, most speculatively, we don't even know for sure that these disks are coplanar with the overall protoplanetary disk. So there's some instabilities which could actually cause those circumplanetary disks to tilt out of the plane and ultimately maybe reorient the planetary spin. So you're looking here at some simulations. These are grid-based simulations where you know, the, the overall plane is the plane of the, of the protoplanetary disk. And this instability is operating and tilting the circumplanetary disk until it reaches you know, 40, 50 degrees um, off, the, off the equator. So that would be a kind of wild, a wild possibility that you have this, this strange dynamics taking place in these disks. So it's, it's, it's a very rich subject. Uh, you know, we're, we're looking at multiple theoretical avenues to it. But the most exciting thing is that we expect you know, a lot more observations of this um, in the near future. So let me just uh, finish up there. Um, what we don't know about planet formation is, you know, I think, lots of things. Um, but I don't want to finish on a, on a negative note. Um, I think one thing I would emphasize is, you know, the amazing observational progress. You know, if you really think we found thousands of exoplanets, we can really observe circumplanetary disks around young exoplanets around these distant stars. You know, that's really amazing, amazing progress that we've been able to do that. And it's driving a, a host of both new theoretical ideas, that sort of pebble accretion scenario I discussed, you know, was only uh, dis discussed first in about 2010. So it's a pretty recent thing and new computational tools, which of course is where, is where, where we're here at Flatarm, we, we come in. And at CCA, we're interested both in that sort of computational aspect on the, on the theory, um, and also on the data side of how you can actually make the, the comparison between the observations um, and the theory. So I'll stop there and take any questions. Okay, great. So if uh, we have questions for Phil, and then um, I'm assuming that the AV crowd can let us know if anything comes in over Zoom. Um, great talk. That was just very exciting. Um, I wanted to know, uh, kind of a big question, big picture question of uh, when you listed all those possible um, putative dynamical processes earlier, um, 
I wonder whether some of the observables say misalign hot Jupiters. Um, you know, perhaps they're you know that misaligned hot Jupiters can probe. Um, you know, whether whether and how fast secular um, secular migration happens, secular dynamical processes happen. But when you superimpose multiple putative um, dynamical dynamical processes, how can how do you think observables yeah. can deal with that? Yes, I mean, I think that's a, you know, it's, it's a great question, and, and it sort of cuts to the heart of why, despite all this data, <laughs> um, the questions still remain remain open, right? Um, you know, I, I think there's some hope in that there are there are some signatures that are fairly specific, right? So, uh, in particular, you know, some dynamical processes have a sort of natural time scale that is relatively short. There are some which are instead billions of years, right? So secular chaos is, a, is the main example of that, which takes a really long time. So if we could like really observe how the typical planetary system evolves between young and, and old stars, you know, that would say something about you know, at least whether say secular chaos works, right? Likewise, if you look at pairs of resonant planets, that says something mostly about gas disk migration because it requires some dissipation. So there are some sort of, key systems there, right? And so, so my feeling is that the, the key is to develop, you know, an understanding of the data samples <laughs> that is good enough to understand, you know, what the selection biases are in the data, and then, you know, really focus in on those special systems, not really on the, you know, the whole population, where, as you say, everything gets mixed up and it, it's, it's kind of hard to, to, to see what's going on. Uh, yeah, thanks for this great talk. I was wondering about the, you showed the simulation of the eccentricity versus periods that formed in the end three planets. I assume that one was done with a one solar mass in the center. How would that be drastically different with a more massive star? Because 200 million years stars to be the lifetime of a five solar mass star. So do we see any configuration with Venus, Earth, Mars around a more massive star that, yeah. Um, so I guess the dynamics itself you know, have some sort of trivial scaling, right? Um, because you know, up, 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 to, up to the collision or cross section, it's going to be just, you know, gonna just have a simple scaling. Uh, the main issues with more massive stars are, are to do with the, the properties of the disk, because you know, once you get to those more massive stars, then the, the, the high energy radiation from the star is going to ionize the disk. So, so those are probably going to be poor environments for sort of many of these things because of that. So I think that's going to be the, the biggest bottleneck. And, you know, observationally, we, we don't really have much evidence once you go, you know, to significantly more massive stars, right? You can go a little bit more massive, but not much more. Rachel. Really nice talk, Phil. Thank you. Um, so it seems like you could constrain these different channels for planet formation from the observations of the, the beautiful disks from ALMA. And obviously to some extent you were using that as motivation to consider it, consider these new channels. So what are the, what are, what are the limitations for directly constraining sort of the mass function of, of these clumps? Is it, you need more sophisticated simulations, you need better synthetic observations, you need better observations. What what's limiting you there from just being able to say it's got to be this one? Yeah. Um, so I, th I think you know. So some of it is um, is just scales and, and, and optical depth, right? So yeah. so a lot is a lot is really really center. enshrouded, and and you yeah. know yeah. even in principle you sort of can't you can't really see. Right. I mean I think the the aspect I didn't talk about, which is very powerful and is sort of still developing a lot, is um, you know measuring the velocity field. From, from molecular lines, mm -hmm. also with ALMA in the radio, right. right? And so, you know, that that does constrain a lot of these things. And in particular, if we really had very good kinematic data on those disks with rings, we would be able to see whether there are planets there or not, mm -hmm. right? Um, you know, the, the difficulty is just that, you know, that requires much deeper observations. You know, it may or may not be possible eventually with ALMA, if it, you know, it hasn't been possible very much to date, right? But it would be possible with just longer integration time. Yeah, and so that's one direction. Another direction, you know, which, which you know about, of course, is, uh, you know, if we could look at longer wavelengths, 
right. more like centimeter wavelength radio, then of course that would probe larger particles. And that would, you know, again, probe a different region of parameter space. And that's of course the, the NGVLA motivation for those, 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 uh, those who know about that. Great, thank you very much. Thank you very much for the um, very instructive talk. I, I have a question about the iron core of the Earth, which we supposed to have because of the magnetic field. So is it known how that forms? Is this simply because iron is one of the heaviest elements among the abandoned ones? Or why do we have so much iron in the core? Yeah, so so that's, that's basically the, 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 the supposed ex Yeah, so, so the question is how, uh, what about the iron core of the earth how did you how did you form how do you form an iron core of a of a planet and what does that say so yeah i i, I think you know the the iron core of the earth is basically consistent with the amount of iron we would sort of expect to have in the earth like material and then it you know it's sinking it's sinking to the core during the during the early phases of the of the evolution um mercury has a much higher density um and there are some exoplanets known that also have very high densities so those pose more of a challenge because you know maybe those are you know, largely iron objects, and so then there's the question: Well, where's the rest of the stuff that should be there? And so you know, in the case of Mercury, um, you know, it's long been suggested maybe there was a giant impact that you know blew off all the non-iron stuff, um, and maybe maybe there are you know more massive planets in exoplanet systems that actually have that same general property. So that's that's a kind of interesting systems for that purpose. We have time for like one, maybe two more questions. So, so that is basically. So, the first answer is that it's a it's a it's a question about chemistry, and I know nothing about chemistry. So, I so the first answer is I don't know. Okay, but but basically there is uh, you know fractionation processes can can take place, um, particularly in the atmospheres of the disks. And so, depending on where you are away from the star, you can you can you can change that ratio. That's how I understand it. Um, and you know, it's, it's actually a large uh, variation. So it's you know a factor of three or something like that. And it's it's more complicated than I told you because actually there are some comets. There's like a subclass of comets that is more like the Earth's oceans. So you know, there's probably there's still in fact some debate about it. But um, yeah, but basically there are pretty distinct variations that we see between the, the asteroid reservoir, which we see in meteorites, you know, we, it's in meteorites that tell us that, and then the comets, which of course is, is all indirect remote observations. Okay, thank you. We'll talk. Uh, so I remember being an undergraduate astronomy student and really learning about this meter size gap, this big mystery in planet formation. Uh, with the advances of uh, streaming instabilities and things like that, how accepted is streaming instability as an answer to that? And how much is this still, you know, one of the big mysteries of planet formation versus how solved is it? Yeah, so um, I think, you know, the streaming instability gives a way of doing it, right? Um, there are still questions about how easy it is to get into the regime where the streaming instability works, okay? And so there's sort of two parts to it. So um, you know, I said it was a linear instability and that's true. And so the instability itself is very generic and robust. So there will be a streaming instability, but having the streaming instability produce the dense clumps that form the planetesimals is you know, a second question. And in particular, there's some recent discussion about if you have a size distribution of particles, which you will have, right? So there'll be some big ones, some small ones, depending on that size distribution, even the, the linear growth rate of the instability can be very different. It can be like very strongly suppressed. So it, in that sense, it's still an open area of research, uh, not so much whether the streaming instability works, but whether it really does the job of making planetesimals. And it might be, you know, it might be that it only works in sort of particular places in the planetary system. You know, so there might be special places where it works and other places where it doesn't work. And so there's a, there's a lot of sort of open questions, open questions there, but it's, I think, still considered substantially more likely than the alternative, which would just be ongoing, ongoing collisional growth, which has this, this meter barrier you were describing.